Uh, and then the other assignment is up that's due on Friday. It was brought to my attention, I guess, that's showing one thing on the calendar. Yeah. yeah. And but the due date, it is it clear at least that the due date in there is on is for Friday somewhere? Yeah. Because yeah. I couldn't find out how to remove it. Like where I put the assignment in, I the date's set correctly. So. Uh, Okay. Yeah, and I wonder if that's because when I first put the assignment in, I was putting them in backwards. I put them in the slack one second. So I put the date for that one as the 27th, but then I changed it. And I wonder if when you first create it, that's when it gets hard coded in Sharpie on the, on, on the calendar or something like that. And then when I changed it, it never changes from there, but I guess goes back, but it is not due until uh, Friday. So if you already submitted it, uh, it is set up to take unlimited submissions. So if you'd like to doctor it up and do something else, you can go ahead and do that. But uh, I guess better to be early than uh, than late. Um, okay, so let's see where we left off. <coughs> All right, so last time we were kind of talking about this idea how human beings solve problems. Memory asking questions and repetition. Probably said something about walking down the hall, not bumping into the walls, that garbage. Uh, we talked about what's the job of computer programming. It's ultimately telling a computer what to do. What's our problem is that we're too good at solving problems. It's hard for us to dumb things down to the computer level because we can't dumb things down for ourselves. You know, just explaining to somebody else how to walk. There's so much complexity in that, uh, that problem that it would be very difficult for us to, well, borderline impossible for us to articulate it at that level, right? There's so many little muscles and intricacies that are happening there. Um, so every single programming language is going to have facilities for mimicking the way human beings solve problems. So they're going to have a facility for emulating memory through variables, asking questions through conditionals, and uh, uh, repetition through loops and functions. Um, so ultimately, what's the job of our programming languages? It's to emulate the way we solve problems so that we don't have to drop down to the alien level of our computers. Instead, we can kind of mostly operate, we'll say as computer programmers, we could say we, we mostly operate as weird humans okay, so that we can talk to our computer through these programming languages uh, so that we don't have to get too weird. We're just a little weird is uh, what it, I guess, comes down to. Because we do still need to slow our thought process down and try to articulate um, the way we solve problems better than we are forced to do when we're working with human beings. Um, okay, so then I kind of put out there that, you know, I'm of the opinion that all programming languages are the same because they're all providing this mapping. So certain languages might lend themselves to certain things. Uh, then we kind of drew this uh, historical hierarchy of, uh, let's call it, uh, important landmarks in uh, programming languages. So this doesn't list all the programming languages that have already ever existed, but this highlights some of the ones that, let's say, are relatively important for how we got to where we are today in terms of computer programming languages. Uh, and we started talking about uh, the, the, the first one. We're going to call this probably our most important language in this list. So we can even, we'll put it in red up there. So this is, we're going to say this is a common ancestor of all of these languages, is the C programming language. So understanding what C had and then what were its weaknesses and why did we move away from that uh, are kind of important portions of uh, understanding how we got to where we are today. Uh, so we, I, I said last time I like to look at C through the lens of uh, of variables, how it allows us to remember things, so that facility for, for remembering, for emulating memory. So C supports this idea of a variable, so a single name linked to a single value. My name is Mike, something like that. Okay, It supports a collection of uh, things associated with a single name. You know, uh, what states have I traveled to? List the 18 states out of the 50 you've been to, that type of thing. Uh, and then this idea of a struct. Um, so we'll call this our advanced type variable in C. So this is a single name linked to a collection of name value pairs. So if we think about ourself as a person, we might say that a person has a name, a person has an age, a person has a weight, a person has an address. You know, we could certainly keep going on past that, but at the very least we could say that 
those are dissimilar things. You know, an address is a different kind of value than an age. Okay, a person has a phone number. Okay, so we have a bunch of name value pairs that all live underneath this umbrella of a person. Okay, so that's kind of what a struct is. Um, so we started, uh, uh, this is kind of why I said start here. So we uh, started looking at what a struct is. So we might have this struct called a person. And inside here, we'll just keep it relatively simple. We might have a string for our name. And then we might have an integer for our age. Let's just keep it at two things there. Okay, so we have a single umbrella known as a person, and that single umbrella is going to hold on to two pieces of information here. One is that person's name as a string, and the other is that person's age as an integer. Okay, so that would allow me to do something like this. I can say person p, p dot name is equal to Mike, p dot age is equal to 21. All right, so I can do something like that. This is all supported by C, this old language that came out in the, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy. So now we need to think about what didn't it do? Why did we move on from C? Why aren't we still using C prevalently today? C is still used today, specifically for... Uh, um, some video game programming, a lot of operating systems programming, uh, we're using it. I teach the 450 class this semester, which is systems programming. So we're writing a lot of C code in there because that's what our modern day Unix and Linux operating systems were written in. So if we're going to talk directly to some of the system libraries in that guy, we need to be speaking the same language it was written in. Otherwise, we're trying to talk to a person who understands English and German, something like that. You might be able to think about it like that. So what didn't this do? Well, it didn't do this. I'm going to throw in another thing here that C did support functions, which supports our mapping slide that says every single programming language, 100% of them will have facilities for these three things. So it will have facilities for variables. We've talked about three different kinds of variable types that C supports. It has facilities for asking questions. C supports the if statement. That's why I said it's usually if statements here. Okay? Because in this hierarchy, C is the great, great grandparent of everything in here. So they all inherited that if statement from C. Um, and C supports this struct type, okay, which is another kind of variable type. But in this mapping, this last part of it here was repetition that we do through loops and functions. Well, C has several different kinds of loops, and we'll talk about those. But C also supports functions. Functions are reusable chunks of code. So we write it once, and we can do it multiple times. It might be nice for us to have a way of displaying a person. So if we were in the C programming language and we wanted to display information about this person, uh, we might have a function, <clears throat> very nice, um, called display that takes a person as a parameter. And maybe this guy will write it in C code to stay traditional. So maybe this guy will print out to the screen, uh, my name is... And my age is something like that. So we have this function called display that takes as an input a person. And it, what it does is it goes ahead and it prints out to the screen the sentence, my name is, and this is a placeholder for a string, and my age is, this is a placeholder for a decimal value. And the first placeholder will be replaced with that person's name. The second placeholder will be re replaced by that person's age. You don't have to know how to do this. That's just what this does. Okay? So this might be something that would be handy to do. So I could then say display P. And that function would say my name is Mike and my age is 21. 
Similarly, I could create a second person, P2, say that person's name is Dave and their age is 17, and I can say display P2, and it would say my name is Dave, my age is 17. All right, so it might be handy to have functions that operate on those structs. Makes enough sense? That would be beneficial for us. Well, a weakness of a struct in general. Now, we can do this in C. Okay, what I just did here, we could do in C. But what would be nice is if I could take this guy here and embed it inside of our struct so that I could actually say something like p dot display. I could ask a person to display themselves. Okay, that would be beneficial from a problem-solving perspective. We have to consider that in the early days of programming when, uh, you know, when C was kind of first brought into the, the mix, the types of problems we were solving were far less complex than the types of problems we're solving today. We can all agree with that, right? Probably the computers in 1970 a little bit less powerful than the computers we have today. Okay. You know, so we were told every, the computers in 1970 were probably a little bit less powerful than the calculators we have today. <laughs> probably a great deal less powerful. I think uh, um, I think there was a study last year. I think uh, I think it was last year's iPhone was actually uh, like eight times more powerful than the original uh, Cray supercomputer. You know what was like a million millions and millions of dollars machine. Last year's smartphone was more powerful than that by a lot. So computing has changed quite a bit and so has the human being's reliance on computers. We have found more and more ways to leverage computers to, to make our lives easier to solve our problems. Uh, did I start the recording? Yeah, I did. Good. All right. So given that, it would make sense that a language that kind of fit the bill for the types of problems we were solving in the early days, maybe start showing some weaknesses as the types of problems we started relying on that, uh, that programming language to support became more difficult, okay? And this is really where the rubber hit the road, is that we did not have the ability to embed functions within a struct. So now we have, you know, our code starts looking, um, uh, I guess we, we might call it spaghetti code, unorganized, because now we're defining our structures here, and then we have functions that work with those structures here, and it's this just giant mess. Instead of having everything kind of compartmentalized inside of a single container that contains everything that has to do with persons. Okay? So, let's just pause that there for a second. With that in mind, I like to say there are three different kinds of programming languages. We have functional languages, uh, which we're basically going to pretend like they don't exist in here. We talk about them in our 470 class. Um, I'll give you a one-sentence catch-all for it here in a second. The two that we care about, though, are procedural languages and object-oriented languages. Okay, so functional languages are languages that uh, are based in functions. Uh, so if you've ever had a, uh, a Texas Instruments graphing calculator, so these would be programming languages that you would solve all your problems in terms of passing one function to another function to another function. So we might take the derivative of the sine of the cosine, something like that. Functional languages would look like that. Leave it at that for right now. Now, procedural languages tend to be linear in nature and monolithic. And what I mean by that is the entire program often exists in one giant file and everything is scattered. Well, let's say everything is mixed together. All right, so we might have a whole bunch of programming logic here 
And only some of this actually is part of this particular run of the program. We might have a bunch of if statements and things like that in here. So maybe we're dealing with some code up here. And then based on the decision here, it jumps down here, skipping over a bunch of crap here in the middle, does some stuff here, then jumps back here, does a bunch of crap in the middle. Maybe it jumps back up here. So very uh, hard to follow as it gets more and more complex. Simple programs, no big deal. In fact, uh, early on, uh, even next semester when we are, are start writing some Java code, we'll do some syntax stuff in, in here as well. Um, we will see that uh, the most of our starter programs are procedural in nature by by definition. Okay, so whether you're doing learning an object oriented language or using a procedural language, your early beginner programs are all procedural. Okay, so we tend to just throw things linearly, do this, 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 this. Kind of makes sense with what we talk about in terms of algorithms. If you're going to make a lasagna, do this, 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 this. Great. Well, as the problems start getting more complex, we have to start breaking them down into individual pieces and maybe hiding some of the details inside of different, different things. And this is where we come into object-oriented languages. So object-oriented languages rely on objects to encapsulate the details of, let's say, various portions of our solutions so that our solution looks cleaner even though all of the details are still there. Okay, we've just hidden them. And I'm going to give you a kind of a real life example of this here in a second. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about the telephone. All right, so let's say we had come in today, and over here on this desk, I had a giant pile of wires. And I tell you that this is a telephone. Uh, at first, you might not believe me, and then you come over and you investigate a little bit. You find some buttons, you find a little headset, you, you pick it up, you hear a dial tone as if those exist anymore. Um, have you ever thought about that? When was the last time you heard a dial tone? <laughs> um, but in any case, you're eventually convinced that this pile of wires is in fact a telephone. All right, Even though it doesn't visually look like a telephone to us, it is a telephone. A telephone defines its function, not the way it looks. The way it looks is how a human being conceives of a telephone, right? Regardless, if we, we, we look at five different telephones, regardless of how they look, we have a decent idea how to use a telephone, so we feel fairly confident that we could use any of those five telephones because they're all telephones and they have a, a minimum criteria of what they should be able to accomplish. Make sense? All right, so the procedural telephone, everything's, that, everything's there, but it's pretty scary looking. Might be a little difficult to use. We have to kind of fish through and find the wires and, and that kind of stuff. So, pile of wires that ultimately is a telephone. Object-oriented telephone actually looks like a telephone. It looks like our, you know, mind's image of what a telephone looks like. So I can show you 10 different telephones and even though these guys physically look a little different from each other, you would be able to identify each one as being a telephone, right? Like, oh, I buy some of the properties of that guy, the characteristics, I could say that's a telephone, all right? So the object-oriented telephone looks like a telephone and has all of the, y, the, the, the details hidden within the, let's say, plastic container and only the public interfaces exposed. Only the parts of the telephone that we actually have to interface with to make a phone work are available to us in what we picture as a telephone. All those extra details, all those wires that are very, very important to the actual function of the phone, but stuff that we don't directly interact with on a daily basis are hidden inside of that phone. Right? That's convenient for us. 
Okay, every one of us recognizes that within our, with our smartphone, there's stuff inside of this that some smart puss person put together, right? It's in there, okay? And if our phone starts acting funny, sometimes somebody might get a little adventurous and crack this thing open and get in there with a soldering iron, and that's usually going to be to their own demise, okay? For the most part, what happens? If we have a phone that breaks down, we go out and buy another phone. Or we find out if it's under warranty first and all that stuff, okay? So we appreciate that those details are in there. We appreciate that they're important to the functionality of the phone. But from a human being's problem-solving perspective, we use a phone in terms of what it publicly exposes to us, all right? Handset, buttons, all that jazz. That is how human beings solve problems. And remember, the job of a programming language is to emulate the way human beings solve problems. All right? That's its job. So that older programming language like C, <coughs> it did not include that additional feature of being able to hide stuff inside of an object. Okay? Well, why not? Having People have been thinking about things in terms of objects since before 1970, right? There wasn't this like jump in our understanding of reality since 1970 where all of a sudden we said, oh, you know, we don't have to have to deal with reality in terms of the details. We can think about things in terms of generalities. No, but what ended up, but this gets back to what I said earlier about the types of problems we were solving in 1970 were very simple problems, okay? So that's another you know, dichotomy we got to deal with is that the problems we solve in computer science, the problems we solve with our computers are significantly less complex even today than the problems we solve in real life. Okay? The act of walking like we talked about last class and earlier today um, is far more complex than the most complex video game that you can imagine is out there today or the most complex operating system. Okay? Writing Battlefield is trivial compared to teaching a computer how to walk, okay? We don't necessarily see it that way because we think of walking as being a trivial task because we're good at it, okay? So good at it, in fact, we don't know how we do it. We can't, we can't articulate it, all right? Now, how many of you have seen, uh, like, some of the, uh, the, whether it's the documentaries or read the... Um, uh, some of the news reports on like the artificial intelligence, the robots that can go up and down stairs and stuff like that. We've seen those before. Okay. So wait a minute. Does that mean that at some point, some really smart person figured out all the little details of walking and was able to program a computer how to walk? What do you suspect? Okay. Okay, it actually would go the other direction. It would probably be able to do many different things that it was never thought, it was never trained to do. And the reason for this, uh, uh, some of you will end up taking this class. We have a class here on artificial intelligence. Okay, artificial intelligence attempts to mimic the way human beings think. Okay, different than problem solve. Okay, for the same reason why we find it difficult to articulate how we walk. That makes it, let's, for the sake of our argument, let's just say it's impossible for us to fully tell a computer in unambiguous steps how to accomplish the task of walking in all different environments, as you pointed out. Even in one environment, it would be, let's call it relatively impossible. But in all different environments, out the window. Can't do that. So instead, what do we do? Well, they build things like neural networks. We A fake brain, if you will, a very simplified fake brain. It's not nearly as complex as the, the, the human brain or even like an insect's brain. But, you know, punchline is we build in software a model of a brain. And then what we do is we start teaching, we start feeding that model information about the area around it. So these robots, they have various sensors. They have accelerometers and gyroscopes and to let it know how upright am I right now and what direction am I moving? Am I falling forward? Am I falling backwards? All sorts of things like that. All right? And based on the inputs from these sensors, the robot has been trained at what point are you going to fall down and how do you adjust to that? 
So just like in real life, if somebody pushes you to the side, you try to put more weight on one side and push up, right? So that's how we counteract a certain action. So now what we have is the robot kind of learns by training. You know, you fall down so you can pick yourself up again, you know, whether the Batman stuff. So, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the idea is that the, 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 the robot starts off being very dumb, not knowing how to react to things. And then it gets a supervised feedback by, let's say, the programmer who says, okay, well, when your accelerometer says that you start shifting this way and your gyroscope says you're not quite standing upright anymore uh, towards the right side, we're going to put extra power into the right leg to push us back upright. Well, how much power? Well, probably not full power because it'll just tip over the other way. So we, you know, it becomes this like massaging it into this area of balance. Okay. And over time, you're able to train that neural network to react to the environment around it. So it doesn't necessarily know, it, could, it couldn't articulate how to walk. But what it can do is it can adapt to the patterns of what's happening around it. So it's doing something much closer to what a human being can do, okay? The, we know how to put power to our leg by thinking, you know, we don't directly think about it, but some, at some level in there, muscles are firing and, you know, contracting and stuff like that to, to make one leg push harder than the other leg. Well, the robot has an equivalent to that, you know, with, with its servos and, and, and things like that to, to make one leg get more electricity than the other leg and push back up. Okay, so it has its equivalent way of compensating for different things. The robot has learned to walk in terms of those steps as opposed to us giving it an unambiguous recipe for accomplishing the act of walking. Make sense? So it's learned the pattern of walking as opposed to learning how to walk. Uh, and that's why... Uh, Quite commonly, what will happen is they'll teach that robot how to walk in a relatively safe, you know, uh, setting, and then they'll turn it into, you know, turn it loose in a setting that is a little bit less even. And it'll be surprising how well the robot is able to handle this new terrain because that new terrain is able to apply the same skills it learned in the safer terrain. Kind of makes sense. Okay, so that's kind of how those things work. Um, but understand, so kind of getting back to where we were going uh, before, um, the types of problems we solved in 1970 did not dictate to us that C had to do more than it originally was designed to do. We can probably, you know, guess that the more a programming language has to do, the more difficult it is to write that programming language, right? So if we want to have a programming language, if we want to have a tool to help us tell a computer what to do in 1970, we probably want that tool to be whatever the minimum viable product is, the minimum viable tool that we need to tell the computer what to do in terms of the problems we were looking to solve in 1970. Well, as the problems got more complex because our computers got more powerful, we started seeing that the tool we designed in 1970 while still viable, had its weaknesses. And adding something new to it, you know, uh, was beneficial to us, okay? And this is where a language like C++ came from. C is a procedural language. C++, as well as everything from this point down, is object-oriented. We'll shift this stuff over here. Okay. So what does that mean in terms of the evolution of C++? I'm going to steal this slide. Go down here. We'll say evolution of C++. Well, we kept the variables, we kept the arrays, we kept the structs, but we added one additional thing here, something called a class. Okay, what's a class? We're going to say it's similar to a struct. 
and I'm going to explain what I mean by similar here in a few minutes, but it would be easy for somebody not in the know to say it's identical to a struct, but it actually is just similar to a struct. Well, identical to a struct in a certain way, that it's, it's not identical to it in that way. So similar to a struct, but also has the ability to hold functions. Which by object-oriented programming naming conventions have now been renamed methods. Same thing. Functions, methods, procedures, subroutines, they're all the same thing. Okay? They're reusable chunks of code. We just wrote that little display function or method or subroutine a few minutes ago. Okay, so class, similar to a struct, but ha also has the ability to hold functions. So let's look at that in terms of this slide here. So I'm going to bring that down here. So what we're going to do is we're going to rename this struct called person to be a class called person. And now this is allowed. So if I can, I would take out that. And this would now be called this dot name, this dot age. Don't worry about that too much right now. Okay. I've changed very little. Basically, I just renamed the word struct to the word class, and now functions are allowed to be stored in here. That's it. Okay, so the difference between a procedural language and an object-oriented language is a level of organization. It's a Tupperware container. All right, so now I have this new container that I could put other things into. Okay, I can put attributes, strings and integers and chars and all sorts of different things that I want to keep track of about, a, in this case, a person. But I, I could also put in functions that operate on tasks related to persons. I could put it all inside of one nice little package, just like our telephone, so that all those features are inside, but when I actually go to use it, only the aspects of it that are publicly exposed, that, that's our mechanism for using it, or the aspects that are, that are publicly exposed. But notice that C++ still supports structs, and then adds this additional thing of a class. And it would have been easy for people who made the jump from C to C++ to assume that Classes were exactly upgrades to structs that have functions. So then you might ask, well, why would I ever use a struct if I could just use a class? <coughs> and we're going to come back to that because we're going to talk about the dude who made that mistake, Java. So we're going to talk about the evolution of Java. Java kept the variable. It kept the array. It dumped the struct because it, er it erroneously made the assumption that, oh, wait, structs are just classes. Well, classes are just structs without functions. So if you need to solve a problem in terms of what you used to use a struct for, all we have to do is define a class and choose not to put functions in it. Now it's a struct, right? It's similar to a struct. And this kind of comes down to this idea of memory. I want to talk about memory for a few minutes. We have this thing in uh, computer science that uh, puts fear into most uh, computer programmers uh, called a pointer. Now, those of you who've had some uh, programming before, do you know what a pointer is? How many of you have heard of the phrase pointer as it relates to computer programming before? It could be zero of you, that's okay. All right, good, so the fear isn't there yet. And hopefully, I'm gonna get the fear to go away, but it's not. You're gonna be scared of them later on. Why? Because memory is, a, is scary, even though memory is very simple. And we'll talk about that, and then you'll forget about it. All right, so a pointer. This is a variable capable of holding a memory address. Okay, doesn't seem too bad. 
Human beings deal with addresses all the time, right? Oh, you know the address of the university, you know the address of your dorm room, you know the address of your apartment or your house or whatever. These are not intimidating things, right? The address of something is a couple of numbers, a street name, a city, zip code, that kind of stuff, right? Not a whole lot to it. No big deal. But wait a minute. That looks scary, right? It's unfamiliar to us. It looks alien to us. That's a memory address. All that is is a number. It just happens to be a hexadecimal number. So it's not even a decimal number. If we converted this to its equivalent decimal number, which would probably be a pretty big number, you know, would this look less scary? Would that number look less scary? That's probably not the translation, but let's just assume it is. Yeah, that's less scary because we're used to seeing decimal numbers. No big deal. But this, this number, this hexadecimal number could certainly be translated into this number. In fact, you know, here we can even, we can even do it. This is an exercise. All right, so this is in the ones place. So we have an E times one. We have a C times 16. We have a 5 times, what is it, 256? We have a 4 times, I think, 4096. Uh, we have an F times 65,536. Uh, we have a C times uh, 1 billion, I copy it, nailed it, times that. We have an A times that. And we have a one times that. All right, good. So now we can do the math here. So um, the hexadecimal alphabet is zero through nine and then A through F. So A is a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So an E is actually a, B, C, D, E, so that's actually a 15, a uh, 14 rather, 14. So that's a 14. This is a 12. That's a five, that's a four, this is a 15. That's a 12, that's a 10, and that's a one. So we just do the math here, so that's a 14. That's a 12 times 16 is a 192. 5 times 256 is 1280. 4 times 4096 is 16384. 15 times. That is that. That is. Oh, let's write it down here. That. That is that. And this is this. All right. So now <laughs> we could add all these guys together. So we have this plus this 
plus oh, this plus oh we I cannot put all those things in there. Uh, no, that's it's bigger than that. I think it's bigger than that. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, maybe not. It probably is that. There. Let's just assume it's correct. If you were to add all these together, it would give you whatever the right number is. Let's assume it's that number. All right. So big number. So imagine in real life that you live on one big long street. Every single house in the entire world is on one big long street. That's millions and millions and millions of houses, right? Well, at that point in time, if every house is on the same street, we don't have to remember the street. We don't have to remember the town. We don't have to remember the zip code. We just index the houses. This is house one, this is house two, this is house three, this is house four. This is house some odd zillion, right? Well, this is how memory in computers work. Memory in computers is an array of memory addresses, an array of buckets. We can store stuff here, 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 so on and so forth. So we index those individual buckets and we index them using numbers. Well, as we see here, a really big number in decimal starts becoming uh, difficult to represent. We can represent it in a smaller footprint using hexadecimal, a base 16 number system as opposed to a base 10 number system. So very, very large numbers in hex are smaller physically than the equivalent value in hexadecimal or in decimal rather. All right, so that's why computers choose to use hexadecimal to represent memory addresses. The problem is, is that human beings are intimidated by things that look like that, okay? because it's gibberish to us. Okay? We don't necessarily make that jump to think about it in terms of what we did here. We don't look at this and say, oh, all this is is which house number that is. Okay. It just happens to be represented in hexadecimal, which is a value that computers are very good at working, working with, and human beings are capable of working with it. We just, we just did the math, but the number got pretty big, right? So our, my little built-in calculator thing here didn't let me keep pasting, but we certainly could have probably done it on our Texas Instruments calculator, I assume. All right, so <clears throat> pointers are just containers for holding addresses. Memory addresses are just numbers. They're just indexes to where in memory a particular value lives. Okay? So, in computer programming, we have this concept about how parameters are passed to functions. Okay? Parameters can be passed to functions in two different ways. They can be passed by value, or they can be passed by address. Passed by value, and this is also, um, um, sometimes passed by address is also called passed by reference. Passed by value says a copy of the value is passed to the function as a parameter or as input to the function. Passed by address or passed by reference, a pointer to where the value can be found in memory is passed to the function as a parameter. Now, one of these is not just natively better or worse than the other. 
they each have their own side effect. All right, so what does side effect mean as it relates to computer programming? Side effect re refers to what happens if I change the value of a parameter within a function. Pass by value, I am changing the value of a copy. So nothing happens to the original value, i.e. no side effect. Make sense? If I pass a copy into a function and I change the value of that inside the function, the original value that was the source of me calling that function does not alter because it received a copy. Okay, if, uh, uh, if you come up and ask me for a quarter, I reach in my pocket and I have three quarters, I pull one of those quarters out, that's a copy of the original mold for a quarter, right? But I hand it to you and you go and melt that down. The other quarters in my pocket didn't just melt down. Okay? You had an individual, you had a copy of the quarter. All right? Passed by address, I am changing the value at the memory address where the parameter actually lives. So, a real life example would be if I told you my home address and you went to my house and spray painted my garage door. When I get home, I'm gonna be in for a surprise, right? I'm gonna see a spray painted garage door. You didn't get a copy of my house, you went to the actual place. So if something is passed into a function by address, by pointer, okay, by reference, these are all synonyms, let's say, changing it will have a global impact, will have. side effect. Okay? Now again, one of these is not necessarily better or worse than the other, but it's still something we need to know about when we're writing that function so that we know what possible ramifications our logic inside the function might have external to the function. Make sense? All right, so we need to know how something is passed. So what we'll start off with next time, talk about structs versus classes in terms of pass by value, etc. All right, and everybody understand the homework assignment for Friday? Okay, you can do whatever format you want, but I just want a, a list of buzzwords. With some definition. Each, each definition needs two sentences. Something like that. Yeah, I don't, he said, does each definition need two sentences? I don't care if it's one sentence or four sentences. I want a elevator pitch, brief little blurb about generally what this buzzword means. Okay? This is not meant to teach somebody how to use this thing forever, but it's also not meant to just tell you how it's spelt. Okay? Give me the world in which that guy lives. Okay, what he's for. So one or two sentences should cover it for most buzzwords. All right, I will see everybody on Friday.